Audio recording for this meeting has begun. Hi everyone, I'm going to do a quick audio check and then we can go ahead and get started. I see that our captioner is capturing my audio, so that is a good sign that I'm coming through clearly. All right. Hello, everyone. On behalf of AgriLink, Feed the Future, and the USAID Bureau for Resilience and Food Security, I would like to welcome you to our webinar today on market-led interventions for seed security response. Today, our panelists will be presenting lessons from two reviews of market-led emergency and seed interventions, analyzing both the supply side and the demand side. My name is Julie McCarty, and I'm a Knowledge Management and Learning Specialist with the USAID Bureau for Resilience and Food Security. And I'll be your webinar facilitator today, so you'll hear my voice periodically, especially during our question and answer sessions. Before we dive into the content, I'd like to go over just a few items to orient you to the webinar. First, please do use the chat box to introduce yourselves, to ask questions, and share any resources you have that are relevant to the content today. We love for our webinars to be interactive, so please don't hold back um, on sharing whatever you'd like to share in the chat box. We'll be collecting your questions throughout the webinar, and we will pause a couple of times along the way to answer some of them. Uh, but we'll also have a longer Q&A session at the end after the presentations are complete. Lastly, we are recording this webinar, and we will email you the recording, the transcript, and any additional resources once they are ready, which is usually in about a week's time, uh, no more than two weeks. And they'll also be posted on the AgriLinks event page for this webinar. OK, I am going to introduce our speakers, and then we can go ahead and get started. We're excited to have a wonderful panel of seed system and food security experts on the line to discuss several examples of market-led seed system interventions. So first up will be Julie March who is Division Chief for Production Systems with the USAID Bureau for Resilience and Food Security. And she recently came over to RFS from her previous roles at the Office of U.S. Foreign Disaster Assistance, or OFDA, and the Office of Food for Peace. And she will be providing some welcome remarks and context for today's talk. Next will be Jean-Claude Rubiogo, who is the leader of the BEAN program and director of PABRA, at the Alliance of Bioversity International and the International Center for Tropical Agriculture, ABC. Uh, Jean-Claude will pass it over to Stephen Walsh, who is an agriculture advisor with the USAID Bureau for Humanitarian Affairs, which was formerly the Office of Foreign Disaster Assistance. And next up will be Jules Keane, an independent consultant with over 20 years experience in international development in both Africa and Asia. And lastly, we will have Kate Longley, who currently leads the Humanitarian Aid and Resilience Portfolio within the Supporting Seed Systems for Development activity, S34D. And S34D is a five-year leader with Associates Award funded by the Feed the Future Initiative. So I will pass the microphone over to Julie March to get us underway. Julie? Thank you. Good morning. I'm absolutely thrilled to see AgriLink supporting Seed System Month. Um, there aren't a lot of holidays that celebrate seed systems, so I feel like this is finally my holiday. Um, it's very exciting. Uh, in many parts of the world, we know that smallholder farming and seed access availability and quality is really at the heart of household food security. It can mean the difference between a population that goes hungry or one that's food secure. And a critical piece of seed system support is how both emergency and development actors approach design and implementation of programs. I'm so happy to see the topic of market-led intervention in the ag sector pre-emergency and beyond getting the attention that it deserves. Globally, we know that the number of large-scale disasters are increasing and are coming more frequently in greater magnitude um, with greater impacts on vulnerable populations. 
we know that the number of people in need has increased. And at the same time, that need spans um, many sectors, so not just agriculture and food security. In the humanitarian sphere, we have to think about shelter, water, sanitation, protection, um, all of those in addition to other sectors that support people in need. To give you a broad idea of um, former OFSA programming in agriculture, for FY 2018, um, about 10% of the total budget of 1.8 billion was um, for agriculture and food security activities. So what does that actually mean for assistance? Um, if you asked me, I would say that it means that we need to get it right the first time, both to ensure that we do no harm and to ensure that we use stretch resources for maximum impact. There's been considerable thought given to the effects of programming repeated short-term emergency programs and a recognition that we need to look up and think about things from a longer-term perspective, even if the funding cycle for emergencies is a short one. That technical framing has stretched to a broader consideration of systems. Thinking about a response that does no harm should also be based in the thinking about the systems that vulnerable populations are a part of. So when we think about farming systems and market systems and seed systems, we can begin to target the real bottlenecks and ensure that assistance alleviates those or strengthens overall system strength and functioning. Over the last decade or so, a strong movement has emerged to employ market-based options when possible. When we use the markets to supply needed goods and emergency response, I think that we put farmers at the center. We enable them to make their own decisions in a more timely fashion in response to information that they have on the growing season and local conditions. Farmer-centered seed support is critical to building resilience for vulnerable populations. Market-based assistance can create, create lasting commercial linkages between sources of seed and farmers, a critical element for long-term system health. A major challenge for populations at the last mile is sustained access to quality seed of preferred variety. Um, and I think that market-based interventions also begin to nudge development and emergency response closer together. The S34D program that you heard about earlier embodies this interest in following a system and looking at it from both a humanitarian and a development lens. And by supporting all seed channels, we promote better food and seed security outcomes. Most importantly, we begin to serve farmers and give them choice. At this point, I'm going to hand it over to our first speaker, Jean-Claude, um, who will talk more about market-based interventions. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Julie. Right, yes, this project, uh, S3 for D, for D, as uh, Julie indicated, is right, thank you. So it's supported by, by USAID through Bureau of Resilience and Food Security and also uh, Office of Humanitarian Aid. Uh, it has a life span from 2018, almost two years now, or more than two years, up to 2023. Uh, is a leader with associates, uh, with options of uh, uh, buying in from the mission, as I said, supported by USAID for the future. It has, as Julie indicated, uh, it, it, it looks on different angles of seed systems. There's a formal, informal, uh, and integrated. There's also humanitarian uh, aspect. So all that together has brought bigger consortium uh, led by Catholic Relief Service uh, with the also other partners being uh, Alliance of Biodiversity and SEAT uh, through the Pan-African Bean Research Alliance IFDC, uh, which brings in the formal aspect. Uh, also, a Pabra looks on the formal, but also integrated seed systems. We also have Opportunity International, which deals with all this requires some finance. So we're looking at how the banks can help the different seed value chain actors. Purdue University, which brings in the, the, the post-harvest 
storage, which goes with the quality and a great experience. Also looking for uh, looking on on FOMO. We also have other service providers like Dimagi, Kusa, New Market Lab, uh, supporting the policy when it's necessary. So it has a global mandate uh, as well, not only in Africa but across also the world. So these are the different uh, members of the consortium. Uh, a great experience. Uh, ABC, CIAT, FDC, uh, Opportunity International, PABRA, uh, PADU, led by CRS, supported by USA. So maybe to give a background on uh, uh, Alliance of Biodiversity and CIAT and PABRA, how we, where the, three, the two studies we'll see uh, later will, were, were part of the work uh, supported by PABRA. So the Alliance of Biodiversity International and CIAT is a member of the CGR Consortium and we focus on six areas of research, the levers, uh, uh, food and environment and consumer behavior, multifunctional landscape, climate action, uh, biodiversity for food and agriculture, digital inclusion, crop for nutrition and health. Uh, that's where the beans, uh, which uh, Fabra is, is a part of it. That's where we are hosted by, by we are nested in the crop for nutrition and health. So what does the PABRA stand for and what, what does PABRA do? It's a consortium of three major networks, as you can see from the right side, uh, three colors, East and Central Africa region. We have one network, ECABREN, Southern Africa, Southern, we have SABREN, Southern Africa Bean Research Network in yellow, and then we have also the West Africa Bean Research Network in red colors. So it's around 31 countries bringing together researchers from national program and CIAT and value chain actors, the private sector, dealing with the seed input uh, and the grain as well. Uh, so we are aiming at improving productivity of beans, uh, beans utilization, commercialization for the benefit of urban poor, uh, urban and rural poor, so including smallholders as well. So we have a lot of component also dealing with the seed. That's why this, uh, these two cases will be uh, uh, talked about as well. So if you look at our focus, Pabra, for what we do in bean, in, in seed, uh, it's, uh, it's from the informal to formal, from the community-based to private sector-led. So we have uh, developed a partnership for scaling up this technology, this seed technology, the varieties, speeding up the access to the community, reducing the time between the, the release and the use, from it used to be like 10, now is around two to three years. Uh, we have also uh, scaled for the last 15 years, more than 30 million farm smallholders were able to access improved variety of beans in Africa. Uh, so we always on constant dynamism to look for best bet to, to do uh, better efficiency in, uh, in the production and delivery. That's why we've been able to get private sector interested in beans than before. There are now even some are in production of uh, early generation seed, and we also devised the small packs, which has been also part of what we initiated in, at the beginning. So and then now it has scaled up to other crops. We also do capacity building for this private sector, for other actors within the value chain, support NGOs. We have resource manuals, which you can get from our website. We also deal with the policy at the, at the national level, at the regional level, because these networks, there's a change of material, so which goes with the private sector trading, as well work with the sub-regional organization, either COMESA or East Africa community or SADC to shape the seed policy. But in addition to that, we also have a work on seed system under stress, uh, which again, will the two cases uh, Julie talked about will be detailed in the, in the, in the next uh, uh, discussion. So that's the background of the seed systems we have. So if you look at the seed aid, uh, as uh, in perspective, as seed, seed is always a very exciting topic, and, and particularly seed aid also has brought a lot of studies in the past. Uh, those who have been working remember the seed fairs and vouchers, direct seed distribution. So seed is very important in terms of uh, agricultural input and development and recovery. Uh, estimated more than, more than 100 million US dollars spent on emergency per year for seed. The widespread is across many countries. 
but also sometimes they are repetitive. But sometimes they can do harm. Uh, I think, uh, again, Julie said you should avoid uh, this uh, harm to the smallholder because they already in stress. If you stress them more, that's dangerous. So, but sometimes it does happen. So how do we go about it? I think that's what you're able to hear from other colleagues. They are repetitive also. They can create uh, aid dependence, which is also sometimes not good. So it may undermine sustainable development of local market. Mar local market is the key. That's where majority of farmers get seeds. So if you undermine it, then that's the interest. So we should avoid the disappointing smallholder, like you can see on that photo. Uh, so that's the reality that's happens. How do you reduce? So the two studies we are going to, to hear their findings. They will be working on the two side of the coins, uh, supply side and demand side. So the supply side, they will be able to review the practice and the possibility of market-led interventions. We'll have several cases where the, 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 the supply of various variety improved. How did it go? How, so again, that's what Steve and Louise did. But on behalf of the two, Steve is going to give us uh, some insight. And then we also have the demand side where also Jules and Dina and Louise worked on. Worked on. So Jules is going to present that as well. It will be looking on the how we see this different also, either direct seed distribution or seed fairs, but this time we're going to focus on cash transfer for seed security in humanitarian setting. So that's uh, the two studies again they will be able to. So I can hand over to Steve to, to continue from here. Thank you, Jean-Claude. Uh, and good morning, everyone. Uh, first of all, I want to uh, give a special thanks to Dr. Louise Sperling, who is co-author with me uh, on this review and was instrumental in setting the context in, in framing uh, this review. Uh, and I'd also like to make note that everything that I say today is my own opinion. Uh, it does not reflect the views or opinions or policies of my current employer. Uh, this review was undertaken before I, I came to work for USAID. Uh, and so I just wanted to, you know, make it clear that uh, what I say this morning is based on work that was done uh, before I took and took my current role. So, uh, First, I just want to make a quick reference to the purpose of the study. Uh, and this was uh, uh, principally uh, to look at a review in an attempt to categorize past experiences. Uh, and then secondly, to identify and move best practices forward, recognizing the enablers and also being cognizant of uh, some of the barriers. Uh, for the methodology for this, uh, the first step was to develop a conceptual framework. This was the framework that we used to analyze a set of case studies. And through using that framework, it is uh, the, the means by which we came up with some findings. So I'll make a quick reference to the conceptual framework. I'll then uh, discuss uh, very briefly, the case studies. I'm not this morning. We won't go into the details about the individual case studies. Uh, the the importance of the case studies is that they enabled us to what we think is to identify some important trends uh, across uh, across the cases. And then, lastly, uh, based on reviewing the cases, we were able to map the cases using the conceptual framework. Uh, and, and from that, we were able to draw what we think are some valuable um, lessons moving forward. Uh, so before I get started, I, I do want to um, sort of contextualize uh, this talk um, in, the, in the review. First of all, just reminding us that seed aid, uh, as is known today, has increased exponentially uh, over the last 20 years. Uh, and what uh, was, you know, under a $50 million a year industry, if you will, uh, back in the mid to late 90s, uh, as of 2011, and again, these are FAO numbers where 
uh, thankful to FAO for, for providing these numbers. Uh, by 2011, uh, this was uh, at least a $750 million a year uh, for the year 2011. Uh, another point to note here is that, you know, seed is often the first entry point in agriculture for populations in stress. And the seed aid that's being provided uh, is done so with a specific focus on the most vulnerable populations. The, the other contextual point that I'd like to make is that uh, it's really critical to remind ourselves where do farmers get their seed? Now, we often want to help farmers where we think they should be. It's very important to start with where farmers are. Uh, and this is work that's been very well documented by, by Louise Sperling with the support of others. Uh, this is based on uh, more than 10,000 um, observations. Uh, the detailed reports backing up this data can be find, found on seedsystem.org. Uh, the important takeaway here, if we look at the orange on the right, is that farmers rely on markets. They rely on markets for seed, and this is even more so for small and vulnerable farmers. And so it, 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 it is really important for us to recognize the, you know, the primary importance of markets as a seed source for farmers. Uh, and, it, and another point to make here is that, you know, while agro-dealers are an important source, uh, they represent a very small source. And based on this work, they represent uh, approximately 2% uh, in terms of a uh, an important source for farmers in accessing their seed. So when we talk about seed markets, <clears throat> I think it's important to consider that, you know, on our left we have the open markets, uh, often called the informal market. And this is typically where farmers will access their cereals and legumes. And on the right we have the more formal markets, which you know, tend to have a focus on maize, uh, particularly maize hybrids, um, but also vegetable seed. So uh, a quick slide on the conceptual framework. <clears throat> I keep our focus on the left. The details on the conceptual framework are on the right, but the point I'd like to draw our attention to is that um, we use the we, – we, we adapted the seed security conceptual framework using the, the parameters of seed availability, seed access, and, and quality. And in addition to these parameters, we added, added an additional parameter to look at two-way information systems. So these were the parameters that we used to look at the cases. Uh, and then we also um, added uh, formal and informal. So we attempted to categorize the cases to the extent to which the, they were actively engaged with the uh, informal or the formal sector. Uh, and a point to make here is that as we, if we look sort of at the right-hand side of this, uh, of this slide, we'll see that there's actually many points of intervention to support markets. And these Opportunities to support markets are not just in the uh, with the formal, but also on the informal. So the case studies. Uh, in total, there were a total of uh, ten case studies. They included both cereal and vegetatively, vegetatively propagated crops. And the focus here was on seed availability. So while we some of these interventions did involve some activities oriented to addressing seed access and addressing seed quality. The primary emphasis of the interventions were on the availability side. And so that was a target for us in identifying the cases. Uh, the cases came both from, were led by uh, both international NGOs, in some cases local NGOs. We had cases where the drivers on the implementation were seed cooperatives. We also had cases where the driver on implementation 
were seed companies. Uh, I think we, we tried to do with the case studies is to get a breadth of case studies covering different types of crops, and through this, we're aiming to come up with a, a, a broad series of trends. Uh, we, we'd like to come up with more cases. To be frank, we had a very hard time identifying these cases. Uh, again, we were looking for cases that were having a, a effort to support the seed availability side in uh, humanitarian crisis stroke chronic stress context. So what were some of the um, points to note when we mapped the case studies? Uh, the details we can find in the report, but a few things that I'd like to highlight here. Um, one is the near exclusive use of modern varieties for all crops. Um, it, it does warrant a point of reflection as to whether an exclusive use of modern varieties is the most appropriate way to go in helping to address the needs of farmers that are recovering or trying to respond to um, uh, chronic stress or responding in an emergency context. Um, the other point here are that uh, we were not able to identify a single case where there is an active engagement with the informal seed sector. If we go back to the earlier slide I presented showing the extent to which informal sector is a critical seed source for farmers, uh, this warrants a, a tremendous, I think, reflection in a moment for us to sort of step back and ask ourselves, what's happening? Why is it that uh, we're not able to see uh, significant or we're not able to identify cases where there's been investment in supporting informal seed sector on the supply side? Um, third point uh, is that most of the cases promoted subsidized multiplication with free or deeply discounted seed. Um, we did have a couple of, uh, I think, really interesting cases that emphasized packaging as the key design feature. Uh, and lastly, um, while we did have a, one case uh, that had an interesting use of two-way uh, two information flows, uh, it did not appear to be a pivotal design point in any of the cases. In the two-way information uh, sharing, we think is a, is a really critical point uh, moving forward. So sort of to wrap up with the last couple of slides, um, five key points to make on the findings. Uh, one is that most of the cases involved restricting market access. And, and this was uh, restricting market access through allowing market access only for approved suppliers or for certain types of seed. Uh, the second uh, takeaway or finding was that we saw no explicit and documented ex ante seed system analysis. There was a lot of implicit analysis of systems, but explicit analysis where it was documented, where there's a reference to the methodology, we, we just didn't see that in these cases. Uh, the third point is that uh, all the interventions were in the formal sector. And they're, they're, you know, this is an important point again to make because the, the formal sector is actually a minor seed source for farmers. And the last point here is the feedback mechanisms between the farmer, the consumer, and seed producers and seed vendors. You know, it, it's great for us to say that we want to put the farmer at the center, but if we're putting the farmer at the center, it's critically important that we have simple feedback me mechanisms so that we get real-time feedback from the farmer as to what they have to say about the material being provided to them. And then lastly, uh, the, it was a bit of a challenge to, come, to get some documentation that was easy for us to be able to decipher what was working, what was not working so well. Um, I do want to say that uh, we're very appreciative to the different organizations that were able to support us with the case studies and with the, with the documentation that was provided. Uh, it was a, a real tremendous effort uh, on the part of these actors to support us uh, with the information that we were able to get. 
But the, this last point is that it was not so easy to decipher some of the best practices in looking at the cases. So identifying uh, what we think are some enabling features for market-led interventions, uh, none of these should be of particular surprise. Uh, the first is the importance to understand local market functioning, both the informal markets and the formal markets. Very difficult to design an intervention that's going to be sustainable at, at a starting point. We don't do that ex ante, that starting point analysis of the existing seed system. Uh, there are tools that exist. Uh, these will be mentioned by my colleagues, uh, but there are certainly tools and processes that exist to do this level of analysis. Uh, the second point is that uh, a focus on seed market demand uh, we didn't see enough of this, and this is important to, to really have an understanding of the, you know, distinguishing farmer demand for, for male and female farmers uh, and doing a, a much stronger job uh, before the intervention uh, is executed to better, to have a stronger understanding of the demand side. Uh, the third point is these clear and simple feedback mechanisms from the seed buyer. Uh, and then a, a fourth point is more market pluralism. Just a fancy word to say more traders, more seed vendors, more seed producers, more diversity in terms of crop and variety. When we talk about market pluralism, that's what we're talking about. And then lastly, a stronger effort towards linking relief to development and building on the, the mostly humanitarian uh, sort of interventions that we saw. Uh, I, I wish I could be more positive because we do see that there's been a significant effort going in terms of the uh, market-led support on the supply side. There's just a lot more work to be done, and there's particularly a lot more work to be done in acknowledging and supporting uh, the informal sector. Uh, thank you very much for your time this morning. Thank you so much, Jean-Claude and Stephen. We wanted to pause here and take a few uh, clarifying questions before we moved on, and then we'll save uh, some of the perhaps more substantive questions uh, until the end of the presentation. Um, so, Stephen, um, there was a slide that you shared about where do farmers get their seed, and it contained um, a pie chart that included um, others as one of the major pieces of the pie. And Ann Kuntz was asking if others is aid support. Is that something you can clarify? I believe it was slide 18. There it is. And Stephen, I'm not hearing you. Not sure if you are on mute. Yes. Uh, thank you for the question. Self. This this other category is self sourcing. It's from the farmer's own stock, but it's also from neighbors. It's also it's also from friends. Thank you. Okay. Great. And then um, Stephen, we also had a question about whether the data you shared is a, a global picture on where farmers get their seeds? Are there differences between Asia and Africa? This is based on the seedsystem.org uh, assessments that were done. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, uh, most of these assessments were done in Africa but they also include assessments that were done in Haiti, and I believe there's at least a few assessments that were done in Asia. Okay, great, thank you. And then uh, one more clarifying question from Aryemo Sunday Okaya. How or what percent is seed aid accounting for in this data? Because in developing countries, Seed aid tends to take a bigger percentage. 
I'm not sure if you need more more details or if you can clarify on that. I I would be remiss to provide a number. Um, I will say that based on my read and my understanding, uh, seed aid actually represents a very small fraction, probably less than five percent of the seed that's sourced by farmers on any regular basis. Uh, but I would defer to you know reading other materials. Uh, this is basically an off-the-cuff response based on, you know, my experience and my read of materials. Great. Uh, thank you. And um, let's see, I think I'll, I'll throw one out to Jean-Claude um, before we move on as well, uh, just because there are a lot of great questions to cover. Um, and so, Jean-Claude, David Resitar asks, can packaging being a, be an effective training tool? Yeah, uh, thanks. Uh, definitely, yes, you, packaging the, the seed or packaging the information. Julie? Was, oh, yes. Yeah, was, oh, was um, packaging the seed or packaging the... Right, you're asking for clarification? Um, I think... I think Good question. I assumed that he meant packaging of the seeds themselves. And oh, David, yep, David says packaging okay. on the seed as an right. alternative. Maybe if I, if I, I mean, if I can get it uh, interpreted the way he, he said, yes. If you, if we usually have been able to to help private sector to pack small uh, packs which people can afford. And uh, and sometimes they are used for demonstrations. They are used for testing new varieties before they buy the bigger packs. So we introduced a small packs approach uh, sometimes back uh, initial before even tropical legume project. We had it was not commercial. Now we helped the private sector to run it as as a commercial. They do during field days. They do during uh, open day or demonstrations. They, and then farmers pick the small one based on their pocket and then they use it to test and to train others and then they graduate to the bigger ones so that's probably if i get right packaging of the seed he wanted to mention so you you can use the small packs as a testing ground as a learning process before you are back to the larger because you cannot you can get uh, to be familiar with the variety as you move yeah Great, thank you. Um, all right, we have a couple more presentations to get through, so I think we're going to move forward. But then we, uh, we're still collecting all of your questions. Thank you for posting them, and please continue. And we'll uh, pause after our next speaker, next speaker for a couple more questions. So I will go ahead and pass the mic on to Jules. Great, thank you, Julie. And thanks to everyone for taking time to join in today's webinar. It's exciting to see the representation from many, many different countries and to know that this is an important topic for, for many of us. And I look forward to our discussion at the end. Um, I will be presenting the key findings on the study of cash transfers for seed security in humanitarian settings. My, the co-authors of the study are Dina Brick and Louise Sperling, and I thank them very much for all of their work um, together on bringing this to fruition. If you haven't already, I encourage you to download the full report um, and read it at your, at your leisure. You'll find a lot of the details that I won't, um, I won't cover during this, during this short time. But before we get to that, I wanted to show this image is of graffiti in the United States. Um, that I saw on a walk while I was thinking about this presentation. And for those of you that don't recognize, this is Cookie Monster, a famous um, character in a children's show. So when I saw this picture, I thought of Cookie, question mark, with the, the metaphor of choice and quality, because ultimately that is what we're talking about in this study, the choice and the quality of seeds. In summary, for the cash transfers 
study that we did, um, we explored the barriers and opportunities that exist through key informant interviews, literature reviews, and a selection of case studies. The study was guided by a multi-agency think, thinking group, um, and I'm happy that Julie March is able to, to join us today. She was one of the members of that thinking group, and they provided excellent expertise and experience on this topic to really guide the direction of the study. The, the case examples that we reviewed included um, Iraq, Ethiopia, Nigeria, Uganda, Zambia, Zimbabwe, Zimbabwe Malawi, Madagascar, and Guatemala. So uh, a wide selection of geography. Um, as you will see, it's, it's more representative of Africa than some of the other regions, and that is the short, purely because of where the documentation and the experience um, is taking place to date. Um, and these these case these case examples reflected the range of approaches that are being used in in cash transfers to proceed security intervention. So all of those cases weren't doing the same thing. Some were doing um, cash transfers specifically for for seeds. Some were providing direct seed distribution with additional um, cash that that farmers could could use to to buy additional seeds that they thought were important to them. The as Steve mentioned in, in his presentation as well, this is a dynamic and evolving evidence base. It's, there's not a lot of documentation um, that's readily available that provides enough detail to know what what really happened and what really were were the outcomes. Um, so I think that as we're seeing, there's more interest in cash transfers for sectoral outcomes. We see it in other sectors. And we expect that in this time, there will be more cases available and we'll have more experiences to learn from, both the successes and the things that didn't work so well that we can all look to, to improve on. Um, the, the study advocates for a multi-perspective uh, multi-stakeholder perspective on seed quality, and I'll get to that seed quality um, in a bit. And finally, we also advocate for expanding the range of options for farmers based on their own context and what their own needs are um, for for their actual um, their actual needs, not based on someone else's decision of their perceived needs. So the key findings, I have about 10 key findings um, that I'm going to quickly go through. But the, the most important one that we start with is the seed system security assessment. And Steve talked about this, and, and Jean-Claude talked about this, and I believe Julie mentioned it as well. It really starts with there needs to be an assessment that is specific to seed that, that looks at where do farmers get their seeds and looking at both the informal and the formal seed market. Um, a lot of times there, that, that aspect is missing from projects, either because there, there aren't seed experts who are available, or because it's not required by a donor, or because there simply isn't the time. So there's the assumption that seed is needed, and that it needs to come from, from certain channels and not necessarily a full understanding of where farmers normally get their, get their seed. Um, and we saw that in the slide that Steve shared, um, showing where, where farmers in all of these different places, the, major, the majority getting the majority of their seed from the, the markets, especially um, the, the informal seed market. Um, Response analysis and effective program design together, combined with that assessment, will lead to farmers spending cash on what we are looking for them to spend it for, in this case, the, the seed system um, expectation. So I think that you know, for cash transfers, there's, there's often this um, 
this underlying fear that people aren't going to spend it on what we want them to spend it on, and then we won't meet the program programming outcomes. Um, but the evidence shows through the cases that if you have that solid response analysis and the effective program design, the farmers actually will spend the money on what you're giving um, it to them for, um, provided that they have they have enough to to meet the needs of that of that identified need. Thirdly, the program preferences on modalities, whether that's direct distribution or cash transfers or vouchers, um, is not consistently analyzed. And it, it can be complex, and it takes time. You might have participants who only know about direct seed distribution, so that's what they, what they say, or people that may have had a bad experience with using vouchers in the past, so they say they don't want vouchers. So it's, it's not as straightforward as just saying what, what would be your preference to, on how to receive aid um, assistance for seed. Number four, mixed modalities. And by this, I'm talking about cash and vouchers or cash and direct distribution. Um, can, can help broaden the crop choices. A lot of the cases showed that even within one program, there were mixed, mixed modalities. So in some cases, um, the, the farmers were given vouchers to, to buy specific crops, but then they could also use cash to buy other crops that they themselves um, thought were, were necessary. And then, and then that was able to then expand the number of crops that they were able to buy. For number five, um, seed quality. Seed quality is probably the most um, contentious issue that I came across while we were doing this study. Um, and by quality, we're talking about both the seed health as well as the varietal quality. Um, but really, when it comes down to it, all of the cases that we looked at and all the literature, everybody thinks that seed quality is important. The donors, the partners, the farmers, <laughs> the government stakeholders. And all of the cases that we looked at that where cash was used for seeds, there was some screening taking place to ensure seed quality. Um, so while it's, while it's important, I don't think that um, it's as, as dire of an issue that, that people are you know, kind of worried about with all quality will, will go out the window if we give people cash. Um, for number six, the cash for seed security interventions are limited, but they are increasing. As I mentioned and as Steve mentioned as well, it's difficult to find documentation of the projects that are, that are going on. But there has been m movement in, in this area in tr cash transfers being used for sectoral outcomes. Um, just as an example on how limited it is to, to date, at least in the documentation of it, for fiscal year 2018, OCA, which as Julie March was, was mentioning, is, is a main supporter of seed systems, out of 120 different awards in 29 countries, only three of those potentially included cash for seed. So it's still something that, it, that is not as common um, as, as some of the other methods, most, mostly the direct seed distribution and vouchers. Um, number seven, the cash plus complementary support is one of the most promising um, most promising means to meet sectoral outcomes. And by the complementary support, that can mean a whole range of things, but primarily is providing information to farmers on, on varieties, providing training to their um, the business skills to see you know what kinds of um, what kinds of seeds they they need to, to look at managing um, the new varieties, et cetera. Um, so there's there's a lot that can be done. It doesn't have to be just cash and give people cash and say good luck. There's a lot of wraparound programming that can go along with that. Um, and finally, the, the nexus between relief and development. Um, Steve talked about this as well. The, the 
when we're looking at cash, it can re it can lead to true market engagement after the emergency and help for business development in subsequent seasons. Now, I should say there's not a lot of evidence right now on that, but there are some cases. We had um, a, some a CRS learning review in three countries that went back several years after the program and found that that was the case, that there was business development and maintained relationships between farmers and vendors after after the fact. Um, and, and just a small point on financial inclusion, I think there's a lot of promise for financial inclusion can be something that, that can happen with, with cash transfers, but the evidence and the reviews so far have shown that unless it's a specific objective of the program, it, it's very unlikely that financial inclusion will happen just simply as a result of farmers having received cash. Um, Number nine, supporting the supply side to bring quality seeds closer to project participants. Again, Steve's study really focused on this um, a bit more that, you know, it, it's, a, it's a dynamic, the demand and the supply side, you can't really separate them. So even when we're looking at this study and trying to focus on the demand side, all of the issues with supply side come up. If there aren't vendors in the market that where people want to buy the seeds they want to buy, they're not going to be able to buy them there. But in most cases, what we see is the markets are functioning. And the informal markets where most farmers buy a majority of their seed, that is where I would say, and the study advocates, we need to be looking on how we can, we can support those markets. And that support can come in many forms to you know, facilitating those market connections, um, helping them better understand their customers that may be repeat customers long after the, the project is, is gone and, and how they can get closer to um, the project participants. Cases of, of uh, vendors using motorbikes to, to bring seeds closer um, to, the, to the project participants even after the, the project had ended. Um, and finally, the, the investment in preparedness for effective cash and seed security response. It's, it's not just going to magically happen that it's going to be an effective response, especially if there hasn't been some, um, some forward preparation. And that preparation takes many forms. It takes um, the organization knowing its own policies and procedures and being able to adapt them for a specific context. Um, for example, using digital, digital uh, financial service providers, knowing who's out there and where their reach are and do they exist and, and do they have that um, reach or is it only on paper. So there's lots of things that can be done beforehand, just as for emergencies you would, you would pre-position stock or something. For cash per seed programs, there are many things you could do to get ready. Um, and again, uh, just the, how important it is to have the, the donor support for that. Um, in 2016, OFCA supported two organizations to, to have an institutional capacity um, support grant to prepare for doing digital cash transfers. Um, and they had some great results from that to be able to adapt to the context. So, so that is, that's really crucial um, and comes out that the programs will be more effective with some preparedness, time for preparedness. Um, so getting back to, to quality. Again, this is, this is probably the most contentious issue um, that has come up. It has been, uh, for those of you in seed quality, you, you know it's been a, a debate for a, a long, long time. It's not going to um, end anytime soon. There, there's basically the, the two poles of the do no harm humanitarian, humanitarian imperative and wanting people to have the best by someone's standard. And there's also the choice and the dignity of farmers and the responsibility of that choice of what they're choosing to, um, to meet their own needs. So as I mentioned at the beginning in our study, we really advocate for having more of a voice for other stakeholders in 
what is the, the quality of seeds and who determines that and can we have a more um, inclusive perspective of what quality seed means. Um, and, you know, there, there is support for that. I, I think I had seen a, a question about some donors don't um, don't support some of the the um, non-certified seeds. I think you know, and it, for OFDA, they they specify in their um, in their guidance that that's not the case. That you could show what measures you've taken to ensure the seed quality, and that can be working with. Um, with ag extension officers um, within the country and doing other visual inspections, a whole range of things that you could do to show that you are looking at quality and you're not just leaving it to chance whether or not this seed that farmers are purchasing with cash that you're giving them um, is, is um, up, up to par. Um, again, that's, that's not to say all donors have that perspective, but it's just to say there is there is movement on this. There is more um, acceptance of the, the different perspectives on quality that exist. And finally, the insights from other sectors. Um, I would encourage all of you to read um, Cal's State of the World on Cash Report. There's a very in-depth section on what other sectors are doing with cash transfers to meet sectoral outcomes. Um, and a lot of the issues that can come up are very similar to the issues that come up within the seed sector. The limited evidence base for the outcomes for sectoral outcomes, concerns about the quality that I just mentioned, and concerns about will participants spend the money on something else and then our project doesn't meet the sectoral specific outcomes. So again, these are, these are common issues across sectors, and there's a lot to be learned um, from other sectors as well as, as, well as in seeds. Um, and a, a final point that the evidence base for sector, sectoral outcomes really needs some attention, um, and I think that would do a long way towards um, showing other um, other sectors that you know this can be done, and here here's what we have learned. But one of the issues with seed is you know, and and I think this is something that um, Louise Burling had had said um, that it's it's kind of a humanitarian orphan because it doesn't really belong in food aid and it doesn't really belong in NFIs but there's no specific discussions that are going on um, around seed at the higher level. And, and that really needs to happen in order to, to get some movement um, on, on using cash for sectoral outcomes. So with that, I would, again, would like to thank you all for your attention. Um, thanks to my co-authors, Dina Brick and Louise Sperling. And thanks to Market Links for hosting this webinar. And I look forward to the discussion. Thank you so much, Jules. Uh, before we move on, I just wanted to ask you a pair of clarifying questions that are related to one another. Uh, Racy Henderson asked, did the USAID statistic on cash for seed include awards for seed fairs? And Orla Kilcullen also asked, how is this different to the CRS seed fair approach, or is this what we are talking about? Sure. Um, thank you for the questions. For the first one, the, the activities for that OCA funded, um, only three of those included cash for seed. So it had to include the word cash to be included in that statistic. Um, and, you know, I would obviously defer to, to Julie March if she has any more information on that. But, no, it didn't, in, it didn't include um, some of the, the seed fairs in that. Um, and the, the second question, this is different from seed fairs because we're specifically talking about cash. And generally, seed fairs that have been done in the past have been um, vouchers, although that is not that is not always the case, and it has been shifting. As I mentioned, there are some that have used multiple modalities, so vouchers for 
um, part of what the recipient is getting and then a top up of cash that is either their own cash or, um, or cash that is also provided to, to meet other speed needs. So there, there's a wide range of possibilities and, and I think that that's really what we need is every context is different and all the needs are different. So we don't need a, um, a one-size-fits-all approach. We need to experiment with, with some of those mixed modalities and see what works in that specific context. Thank you, Jules. Um, and also, just really quickly, I'm not 100% sure if you've already covered this exact angle, but Neil Miller asks, do you have any perspective on vouchers as an alternative to cash? Um, I was wondering if that's something you could clarify on. Yeah, sure. I mean, I think that vouchers have have become very common. Um, you know, we if you sort of follow the the timeline there in the beginning there was a lot of direct seed distribution there still is then vouchers came along and then there was a lot of voucher distribution and there still is and then cash came along so now we've got kind of hybrid um, models out there and experimentation going on and and I think that's good uh, the our study doesn't advocate for always use cash or always use um, direct seed distribution, it really comes back to that assessment and analysis and seeing what's, what's happening in the place that, that you're in rather than just, you know, co copying and pasting what was in some other place that worked. Great. Thank you. And um, thanks to all of our presenters who are sharing your experiences and helping answer each other's questions. We really appreciate that, and we will try to get through as many of your questions as we can uh, once we open it up for a full Q&A after Kate's presentation. So I'd love to pass the microphone over to Kate, and uh, we'll keep going. So Kate? Great. Thanks, Julie. Thanks, Julie. And I just want to check Thanks, that you can hear me okay? I'm getting an echo from you. You may need to mute your computer speakers if, that, if those are open as well. Okay, hopefully that's a bit better now. Yeah. Great. Okay, so thank you to Julie March and Jean-Claude, Stephen and Jules for their presentations. And I'd also like to acknowledge Louise Sperling, who really played a major role in commissioning and undertaking the two reviews. Uh, so the webinar has focused specifically on market-led or market-based programming in emergency seed interventions. But at, at a really more general level, what we're advocating for is more appropriate seed security responses in emergency contexts. And conventional approaches to seed aid have really tended to overlook the important role of seed markets, and especially informal seed markets. And in some cases, this has led to negative impacts, either for farmers themselves or by undermining existing seed systems. And like Jules has said, in the humanitarian sector in general, market-led or market-based programming in crises is, is currently receiving much greater recognition than in the past. And we really believe that a similar market-sensitive approach also needs to be applied to seed security interventions. So I'm just going to um, really emphasize, there's just three key messages that I really want to emphasize. Um, so first, we need to better understand informal and formal seed markets. Second, we need to be much more explicit in conducting response analysis, and I'll explain this in more detail in a minute. And third, we need to continue to learn from innovative market-based seed security interventions. So the first uh, um, lesson, or the, sorry, the first message in, in understanding informal and formal seed markets, um, we have existing tools to understand seed markets. Um, so we've already mentioned um, the CETIS System Security Assessment Tool, or SSSA. It provides a really well-established method for assessing the security of farmer seed systems. Um, and just responding to one of the questions, no, I don't think it does actually include uh, land tenure. Um, there's a lot of information that's packed into these um, SSSAs. Uh, they, they, they look at situations of acute and chronic stress. They help pr practitioners determine what kind of seed-related assistance is needed in both the short term and the long term. There's a lot of information in here, and I think land tenure, there just isn't the space for that in an SSSA. 
Um, so they're looking at the ways in which farmers normally acquire seed, whether it's from their own seed saving practices, from friends and neighbors, or from seed markets, and it assesses how these systems have been affected by disaster. And then another tool is the Emergency Market Mapping and Analysis Toolkit, or EMMA, um, and it's designed for use in sudden onset emergencies to understand critical market systems and the system's ability itself to respond to the crisis and, and what are the gaps that need, that, that need to be addressed for the target population. So the SSA methodology, sorry, SSSA methodology and the EMMA Toolkit are complementary and can potentially be used together. But regardless of which tool it's used, it's necessary to understand not only formal seed markets, but also informal seed markets and the roles of informal traders. So the data that Steve presented earlier, um, this is coming from the seeds, uh, SSSAs across six different countries. Um, it, sh it shows that 50% of seed is planted by smallholder farmers is coming from local markets, and less than 3% actually of what farmers normally plant in, in these kinds of crisis um, situations is coming from formal sector agro-input dealers. So within these figures, of course, there's important variations among crop types. But really, the point that we want to emphasize is that informal seed markets are really important to farmers in, in both in normal times, but also especially in, in times of disaster. And these informal seed markets should not be overlooked when considering possible market-based interventions. Okay, response analysis. Um, this is the crucial but commonly neglected link between understanding the market context and designing an appropriate response intervention. So both the seed system security assessment and the EMMA toolkits include steps uh, for response analysis. And I realize the diagram here on the slide is largely legible, but it just want, it's just to illustrate the need to consider the full range of response options that can be appropriate to a particular situation. So this is a, it's a decision tree from recent guidelines developed by various partners within the global food security cluster. Um, and I, I can put a link to, on, the, on the chat page in a minute. Um, and similar decision trees are commonly used as part of seed security assessments. In this case, the decision tree is used to determine whether seed access or seed availability is the problem. And it presents a range of options for various demand side interventions to address problems relating to access and it highlights supply side interventions to address availability constraints. And I know there have been some questions about you know, what kind of uh, interventions constitute these supply side interventions, so we can address that in the Q&A. And then in considering the various response options, it's not necessarily an either or decision. So like Jules was saying, it's important to consider a combination of different modalities or, or to look at mixed modalities. So for example, combining cash with vouchers or cash with direct seed distribution. And these combined modalities can, can broaden crop and varietal choices available to farmers. Um, and sorry, just, go, uh, just one more point on that. Um, as part of the response anal analysis, it's necessary to analyze the likely impacts of various intervention choices, and especially their potential to do harm or to lead to unintended negative consequences. Okay, and then the third um, key lesson is that you know, we'd really like to encourage continued learning from market-based emergency seed interventions. Um, and the, the types of interventions that formed the focus of this with the webinar and, and uh, specifically the two, the two publications constitute a relatively new approach. And so the cases that are described in the published reports represent what we believe are the first approaches of their kind. And we'd really like to encourage donors, implementing partners, and others to build on this and to support and design new alternative approaches where these are seen to be appropriate. Because um, really, there's a lot more that can be learned through seeking out and documenting uh, innovative approaches. So the Supporting Seed Systems for Development Activity, S34D, will continue to document and, and, and uh, to document innovative approaches and share lessons, and we urge others to do the same. And so the S34D initiative is really keen to hear about your experiences, and we'd, we'd like to hear from you. Um, so please do get in touch, and thank you very much. Thank you so much, Kate, and thank you to all of our presenters. Uh, wow, we've had a lot of really great conversation in the chat box. Thanks to everyone for sharing your perspectives. 
Um, as some of you know, this was Seed Systems Month on AgriLink, but I think this webinar proves that there is still so much more to discuss um, about seed systems. And so we'll be sharing all of your questions um, and comments with uh, the heads of our, our Seed Systems Month who are leading the charge, and perhaps we can continue to uh, have some good blog posts and discussions uh, going forward on AgriLink's uh, about seed systems. And right now we will dive into our open Q&A period. We've been collecting all of your questions along the way, and we'll see how many we can get through in the next 15 to 20 minutes. All right, let's see. There's so many to choose from. Um, OK, so Kate, um, I, I figured I'd throw you a question from Carl Wall, who asked, can you give some specifics for what you mean by supporting supply side, particularly for the informal or open market? So what does that mean to support the yeah. supply side? OK, and thanks. And hi to Carl. Um, uh, just check, you can hear me? Yes. Yeah. OK, great. Um, and I, I mean, there's been reference to the current COVID crisis, and because of the the restrictions imposed on markets and and general movement, uh, you know, for farmers to access markets and for traders themselves to to undertake their market functions in, in moving stuff around from place to place, the COVID restrictions have have really affected markets, and so some of the market type or market systems or market based interventions that have been proposed specifically in response to COVID, um, would include things like uh, working with local authorities and governments to ensure that traders are able to move around in a safe way within uh, the restrictions or, or to loosen restrictions where possible to emphasize uh, and just to, to, you know, to, to make sure that the local authorities are aware of the importance of seed markets, particularly at planting time, and to make sure that farmers can access markets. And in some cases, uh, the type of supply side support might simply be advocating for local traders to be able to continue their trade in, in ways that are safe within COVID. It might be another example if they're lacking transport, for example, to provide transport vouchers to help them to transport their uh, seeds and grains uh, into local markets so that farmers, they're, they're available to farmers. It might be something like providing cash loans or, or securing loan facilities for traders so that they can continue that supply through the informal market system. Great. Thank you, Kate. And another quick clarifying question for you from Loretta Burns. Is it still FAO that leads the way in determining the need for seed distribution? Um, yeah, in many, oh gosh, sorry about the echo. Okay, is that, have I got rid of the echo? Yeah. Yeah, okay, great. Um, yeah, in, in many contexts, in many countries, FAO does tend to take the lead, um, and it's, it's often when, when FAO takes the lead, it's, uh, they might be leading to do a multi-agency seed system security assessment, and they have their own tools, they do their, they have a, a very similar methodology for doing seed security assessments. And quite often, FAO um, is able to secure the resources through UN emergency funding mechanisms, and then they subcontract uh, implementing partners, often NGOs, to do seed responses. Uh, so yeah, FAO does often play a, a leading role, but it's not exclusively FAO, yeah. Great, thank you. I'm going to jump back to some questions that came in closer to the beginning of the presentation. Um, and I'll address them to specific presenters. But of course, if any presenter would like to chime in on any of these questions, uh, please feel free to jump in um, and, and interrupt. Uh, so Daniel Otwani, uh, this question is for Steve. Uh, Daniel Otwani asked, what is the role of the farmer saved seed in the humanitarian setting? What is the feasibility of using it for humanitarian assistance? Uh, if I understand the question, the, 
it's, is there a role for farmer saved seed in a humanitarian setting? Um, yes, um, it is an important source of seed. Uh, and unless there's some, you know, quality issue with the seed, either there's a pest and disease infestation or there's some systematic breakdown that means the variety is no longer any good, um, it is fine for seed. And what do we see happening in humanitarian contexts? Farmers share their seed. Um, and so, you know, in the to the extent that there is that farmers are facilitated to share their seed, uh, they will share their seed more. This, this is, you know, often the experience. Uh, I'm, I'm not suggesting that it, we must only focus on, on farmer seed, but it's just an acknowledgement that, that farmer saved seed continues to be an incredibly important source of seed, uh, and it's an important source of seed even uh, during uh, humanitarian crises. But uh, I will say that, you know, it's context specific, that in every context, it is very important to, to do that analysis. Uh, for me, it's applying the seed security conceptual framework and, and trying to understand, you know, are there underlying quality issues? Which demographics of the society are suffering most in terms of their seed security? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Steve. See, a another question um, from Gary Alex. Are there key constraints in the emergency nature for design of these seed activities? The problems seem to lie in inadequate understanding of the local system. Analyses of the local seed systems and social analyses of beneficiary preferences, linkages, and capabilities would take time. Um, and I think it was suggested that Steve, you kick this one off, but if anyone else has something to add, please feel free. Um, I just a comment, yes, I agree wholeheartedly. Um, in the paper that was presented in our paper with, with Louise Sperling, uh, there's a wonderful example of uh, a local seed system analysis that was done in Uganda. Um, that was an analytical paper. They basically analyzed the functioning of the local seed system. Uh, this was work that was done by Richard Gibson and Paul. For the life of me, I can't remember Paul's last name. Paul was the lead author. Um, but they did a fantastic job of demonstrating how robust and resilient the local seed system for sweet potato vines is. Um, so, you know, there are, there are a lot of uh, examples out there of, you know, effective use of the local seed systems. And, you know, there's plenty of tools out there that are available. Uh, I will make a note that the, the uh, CGIAR, the root tuber and banana program of the CGIAR has also uh, uh, developed a framework for analyzing um, seed systems. They, similar to, to Sperling, um, they developed a set of, of tools uh, and, a, and a framework Maybe that was also on that, based on Julie, the use of uh, the seed if you allow me. conceptual framework. Right. Yes, I, I think the case I can give example of beans that we know farmers will not sure, buy seed every uh, certified seed every season, but they they probably source from the market or from the neighbor or they save. So one way to enhance their capacity is to inject a critical amount of uh, any variety, and then it trickles in the system in their own way. So. That allows, we know, they will not change uh, the seed regularly, but if you inject that critical mass and then it goes uh, from farmer to farmer or from market to farmer, and then you find in a few years that variety has spread. So the local seed systems work very well, either from, from neighbor or from the grain market, which is important. And farmers also can keep the quality. They, and the traders now have seen, we just uh, complete another study recently in Tanzania, which probably will share one day on this platform, is, is that you find the traders also, they know what farmers are looking for. They keep that for the, the time of planting and people can go and buy specific variety they're interested in. 
So the local market is very important. The only way to do is how do you in strengthen it? How do you inject a new variety which respond to the farmer's need? That's what we, we developed. Great, thank you so much, Jean-Claude. Let's see. So if I can just add quickly on, on that. Um, Please do. Tool speaking. Um, in, in a lot of the places that have emergencies, we actually, as, a, as an international development community, we have a lot of the knowledge on, on those seed systems. And, you know, the, the seed systems assessments exist in places. You know, I'm thinking of Ethiopia and Haiti and places where there's consistent seed aid. If we, as a community, took the time to look through some of those things and, and use that as a starting point, it, it doesn't have to be time consuming. There's a lot of knowledge and experience um, out there. Thanks. Thank you, Jules. See, I have another question uh, that, that Steve, I believe you can speak to, uh, which is from Ann Kuntz, who asked, can you comment on the donor restrictions in sourcing seed and lessons on how to support the informal sector on seed supply given donor requirements? Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, I think it's really important to go back to the individual countries in the existing seed laws in the individual countries. Um, there has been an effort over the last decade to revisit seed laws in different countries, uh, but ultimately, you know, all donors, you know, respect the sovereignty of countries where they work. And so the starting point for determining, determining what's acceptable and what's not acceptable is the you know, the underlying seed law in, the, in different countries. I, I can't make an immediate reference to one country or another right now, but some countries are much more amenable to the open sale of farmer varieties. Um, some countries will allow for farmer varieties even to be, they allow for a special provision for farmer varieties to appear in a national catalog. In other countries, less so. Um, and so I, I just think it's important to, and this is often not done, it, it's really important for organizations that are operating in a country to familiarize themselves with the seed law. Uh, and it's also really important, and it was an oversight on, on, in my talk, not to make a reference to the critical importance of the national research programs. Uh, they play just such a critical role uh, in helping organizations have an understanding, um, not just of the seed law, but, you know, importantly of the existing um, crops uh, and varieties that are important to farmers. Uh, I made a reference to that in the chat box. Uh, thank you. This is Julie March. I, th I think it's also really critical to open the door as a donor to a wider um, range of seeds. And I think that um, what we at OFTA had found was that the state of practice was moving towards things like seed fairs um, and voucher programs, but that if we were requiring certified seed, we really limited serving farmers in the way that they needed to be served. Um, so we worked long and hard to come up with guidance that both ensured that farmers would still get a quality product, right? We have heard tons of horror stories about poor quality seed being distributed late, um, and that does no good to the farmer and actually does harm. But I think um, keeping in mind seed regulations and, and that element, also looking at what crops, what varieties farmers want, and where they normally source their seed, then allows the donor community to start to think about how to do that within their own 
um, guidance and regulations. So um, it was a long process on the OFTA side, but I think at the end, giving implementing partners flexibility ultimately leads to better farmer choice and options. Thank you. All right, thanks so much, Julie and Steve. I think I'll ask um, one more question for now, and then we will head over to our polls and also give you all the opportunity if you'd like to download all of the resources that were mentioned today. So I'll, I'll throw one more question out to Kate before we wrap up. And that one is from Abu Yarma. Even though seed aid can pose real risks to farmers if not properly planned, what are the available options in the non-existence of functioning seed systems, especially in a chronic emergency? Yeah, thanks for the question. Um, I think, I mean, when you talk about the non-existence of functioning seed systems, I think probably you're referring to the formal seed system. Um, and certainly in a it, formal seed systems do get overstretched in, in emergency context, partly in some cases by the emergency itself, as in COVID, but also by a really massive increase in demand for seed coming from these donor-funded seed programs. Um, but the informal seed systems, by contrast, are actually incredibly resilient. And as we've seen from the case studies here, the, it's, it's the, these informal seed markets which are often able to, to respond um, by providing seed to farmers in, 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 in crises. Um, so rather than being non-existent, it's these informal seed systems that, that are really resilient and play a really important role. Great, thank you so much. I'm sorry that we weren't able to get to every question, but um, we will certainly continue to uh, sh share those with the presenters and see what we can do uh, to continue discussions on all of your questions on the AgriLinks platform. And so please be on the lookout for the post-event email, which will contain all of the resources from this webinar. I'd like to go ahead and pull up our closing poll and ask that you all take a moment uh, to answer those if you are able. So we'll see if we can pull those up. Ah, here they are. And you'll also see on the bottom left of the screen that you can download the webinar slide deck in the file downloads pod and that we've also provided uh, a range of links to the resources that were mentioned in the webinar today. Uh, so please let us know whether you can apply what you learned to your work. And always, uh, we'd love to have your suggestions for improving these webinars going forward. All right, so I would like to provide an official thank you to um, the AgriLinks team for running uh, this excellent webinar and the full AgriLinks webinar series. And uh, thank you to our presenters um, for your depth management of the questions and the presentations. And most of all, thank you to our participants for your wonderful engagement and for continuing to return to the AgriLinks webinar series. So we'll go ahead and 